I'm Dr. Oksana Baltarowicz from the Jefferson Ultrasound Research and Education Institute at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. Uh, this talk is about um, how to avoid pitfalls in transvaginal sonography. We'll go through a stepwise fashion uh, through the transvaginal exam and pinpoint where pitfalls may occur. The objectives of this talk um, are, first of all, to improve the technique of transvaginal pelvic scanning so that we can optimize our accuracy of interpretation. Uh, we're going to re-examine the steps during the transvaginal scanning procedure and uh, pinpoint where errors in interpretation may occur and uh, correlate the different positions of the uterus in the pelvis with the transvaginal sonographic images for a better understanding. So basically, think about how you do a transvaginal scan. You start from the beginning with the history. So to avoid the pitfalls, you want to know the, the, the uh, correct OBGYN history. Uh, you do want to start with the transabdominal pre-scan. Then once you're doing the transvaginal, you want to understand your image projection. Uh, make sure that you have the correct beam orientation. Check your different points of technique. Then as you scan, start with the bladder, the cervix, um, the uterus itself. Know the blind spots in the pelvis. Be persistent about finding ovaries. Maneuver the probe um, in different ways. Use Doppler at the end and think of uh, gynecologic, uh, think of things beyond gynecologic conditions. All of these in a stepwise fashion uh, uh, we will uh, discuss here in this talk. First of all, know the OBGYN history. It's very important, especially in, in uh, gynecologic and obstetrical history, to know the age of the patient to know the parity of the patient, the uh, date of the last menstrual period, um, the hormonal status of the patient. Is the patient on any uh, specific kind of hormones for fertility treatment, for replacement therapy, for uh, has had um, chemotherapy, any type of uh, uh, agents uh, that could affect the uh, reproductive, um, the appearance of the reproductive organs any special circumstances uh, in this patient, and listen to the patient. Ultrasound is one of these areas where we actually do still have patient contact, and while we're scanning, we can hear more detail about the patient's condition uh, and uh, look for the abnormality uh, actively. Uh, in, in, uh, as far as knowing history, uh, when we have a situation of pregnancy, it's very important to know have there been any pregnancy-assisted uh, techniques because this puts us on a special alert because of the possibility of heterotopic pregnancies. In patients who have undergone ovulation induction, the risk of heterotopic pregnancy is about 4%. Uh, and 1% of pregnancies with um, IVF and GIFT procedures end up to be heterotopic. So we don't just look at the intrauterine pregnancy, we look outside um, in the adnexal regions. In this case, there was ovulation induction. We see an enlarged ovary with cysts, but because of the risk of heterotopic, we look carefully and we spot that not only was there an intrauterine pregnancy here with an embryo, but there was an extrauterine gestational sac and ectopic pregnancy and the rest of the ovary was out here. So um, yes, uh, that would alert us. We have to know this information. Now as we're scanning the patient, here's a, uh, we listen and in, in this situation here the patient is telling us that the pain is not really in her pelvis. It seems that the pain is in her abdominal wall. She came as a pelvic ultrasound but we convert, we change our transducer to a high frequency linear probe and we scan the area of pain, which was in the abdominal wall, and here we see a mass 
um, that ends up to be abdominal wall endometriosis. Another patient who had pain, not really in her pelvis, but in the abdominal wall, and on talking to the patient, she had had um, a sarcoma earlier in her life. So uh, doing a biopsy on this solid mass in the abdominal wall, it turned out that this was metastatic sarcoma years later uh, in a patient who had abdominal wall pain, not specifically pelvic pain. Uh, another way to avoid problems, pitfalls, uh, is to pre-scan transabdominally. Now, transabdominal pelvic sonography in its pure form is no longer really practiced. Um, what we're talking about here is still to take a look at the pelvis transabdominally, but not necessarily to have a full bladder. A full bladder is not necessary anymore, so we can have a patient come in in a natural state, bladder could be empty, bladder could be partially filled, put her on the table, take a quick look around the pelvis, looking for a large mass, a large uterus, something that could easily be missed by just doing transvaginal sonography. Uh, so when we schedule these patients, they just come in in a natural state. Uh, we look at them quickly, few spot views transabdominally, have them uh, empty the rest of their bladder. In the meantime, quickly set up the transvaginal um, probe and do the examination. Uh, we do have some evidence um, from um, an article out of Boston in a study that uh, they did on 206 patients. Uh, transvaginally, uh, when they did transvaginal alone, that was sufficient to visualize all of the significant findings in about 85% of patients. That meant that an additional 15% of patients still required a transabdominal scan um, without a full bladder to get the information. Only 1% of them actually required filling of their bladder. So if a patient comes with an empty bladder and happens to be in this very low percentage that she would need a full bladder, we will then have her drink and fill her bladder. This may happen, for example, in a very young uh, girl, uh, a virginal patient, uh, a very uh, old patient uh, who cannot tolerate a transvaginal exam. But that will only be a very small percentage of patients that have to sit and wait and fill their bladders. The value of doing this transabdominal pre-scan is that it gives us a general pelvic overview. We can quickly estimate the uterine size and see will we have trouble imaging this uterus uh, with the transvaginal probe or not. We can look for a mass above the fundus of the uterus such as a pedunculated myoma or a large ovarian mass or even an ectopic pregnancy in a high position. And we can quickly assess for intra-abdominal fluid with the same probe. If you do transvaginal sonography only and bypass this step, you are liable to miss or misinterpret a large mass, incompletely scan a large uterus, miss an intrauterine pregnancy or an ectopic pregnancy or a mass in a high location, misinterpret an ectopic as an intrauterine pregnancy. That's something that uh, is unusual but could possibly be done or miss a large hemoperitoneum by not checking the right upper quadrant. If you scan only transvaginally, as in this case here, you could miss a large mass. Now this looks like a perfectly normal uterus. Uh, however, uh, the transabdominal pre-scan showed us that there was a large mass somewhere up high above that uterus and even here on an extended field of view scan we see that it is a very large mass. It's actually a pedunculated uh, myoma attached to the fundus of the uterus. If you just started with the transvaginal, how would you know that there was something attached to the fundus of the uterus? So we go systematically from transabdominal to transvaginal. Now here's another one. If you just did transvaginal, this looks like a somewhat small uh, uterus. There seems to be an endometrial uh, lining here, but this was actually a very long uterus on the pre-scan. 
Uh, and when we, we knew that, so we were questioning this, where is the, this, this only measured about four centimeters, where's the rest of that uterus? So we knew that it was about 11 centimeters long. We searched more carefully, opened up the depth, found that it was really uh, retroflexed and found the entire uterus. What we were actually looking at was only the cervical part and we were not imaging the corpus at all. Here's another example. Uh, here's a transabdominal pre-scan uh, that showed us a very um, high location of an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, and so therefore, when we looked uh, transvaginally, we were very careful. Uh, if we wouldn't have seen it, we would go back transabdominally and study it in more detail. Here's a situation uh, where an ectopic pregnancy was mistaken for an intrauterine pregnancy. Now, first of all, there was a live embryo here, okay? And uh, on the transabdominal pre-scan, one sees that something is not right with the lower uterine segment. We do not have the normal appearance of a cervix blending into the uterine walls. We have some kind of a thickening? Uh, is there a mass down here? It does not look normal. So we have to be careful now when we scan to figure this out. And what had happened here was the uterus was pushed way to the side uh, and the ectopic pregnancy was actually sitting in the middle of the pelvis so that uh, it, it almost looked like an intrauterine pregnancy, but because we knew that something was not right, we were able to find the uh, uterus and, and make that call. We don't want to miss a large hemoperitoneum. When you have this uh, pre-scan, you just take the same probe and slide it up under the ribs. Uh, this was a patient with a ruptured ectopic and had a very large amount of a hemoperitoneum in the right upper quadrant. We don't change the patient's position. We don't change the probe. We just slide it up under the ribs. If you do transvaginal alone, what you have to do then is change transducers, convert, have the patient um, move back up on the table. This could shift the fluid uh, back down into the pelvis. Does not make that exam as reliable. Now we have to also now uh, understand uh, the image pr uh, projection. The transvaginal image is projected 90 degrees counterclockwise on the monitor from what we think that we're seeing anatomically. So let's look at this. Here is uh, the uterus. Here's the probe with the beam, sagittal. This is how it is in the body, but the machine rotates it 90 degrees counterclockwise on the image so that the image is at the top of your picture and comes out. So this is anterior here. This is the anterior part of the uterus. And when it's rotated, this is anterior. So this is anterior, posterior, this is cranial, and this is caudal. Let's do that again. See, caudal is this way, caudal, right here. This is cranial, anterior, posterior. The same thing happens when it goes coronal or cross-section. It still rotates 90 degrees, but in this case, the right side stays on the right and the left side stays on the left. So that when the beam goes into the body, yes, the machine does invert it or rotate it 90 degrees, but it's easier for us to understand the right and the left side. Why is that important? Well, that periodically helps us figure some things out, as in this view here. We have the uterus, and it has an interface here in the middle of the cavity. Now, we know that this is anterior, and this is posterior. So that means that this fluid level is in a dependent position. And the fact that it is up and down on the picture doesn't bother us now because we know that it, something is layering within the uterus because this is anterior, this is posterior. 
And here's an adnexal mass, a sagittal image of an adnexal mass. We know this is anterior. We know this is posterior. Our, our level shows us that dependent material is uh, to the posterior. And even though the level's up and down, we still know that's dependent. That happens um, to that's, helps solve us complex cases like this one, where the echogenic material is on the non-dependent portion, which means it's floating. So now, once we make that decision, we know this is anterior, this is posterior, this is floating. Fat floats, we now have a 99% diagnosis of a dermoid. Check beam orientation. We have to be careful which part of the beam is up and which part is down, and that's sometimes hard to do uh, on this uh, transvaginal probe, which has a very um, uh, small, rounded uh, interface, and it's hard to figure out exactly where the beam is. This could be, um, you, could, you could have rotated the probe, someone could have changed left, right on the machine, pressed the wrong button. Uh, so the way we do it is by checking where's the urinary bladder. So why do we even bother with this? Well, first of all, we have to make sure that the image is not reversed. That would help us with the proper uterine position. So if it's an antiverted uterus, if it was reversed, it would look retroverted and vice versa. Also, when we turn 90 degrees into the um, transaxial plane, um, we want to make sure that the right side is correctly registered on the, uh, so we don't mix up the placement of a mass. And it gives us a brief t interval of time to just focus a little bit on the bladder, and sometimes we pick up bladder abnormalities. So this is where it becomes important. You have a picture like this, and it looks like the uterus is antiverted. But you see, we could actually just press the left-right button and flip it around. So how do we really know what's the true position of this uterus? Is it an antiverted or a retroverted uterus? Well, the only way to really tell is to check the position of the bladder. On a sagittal scan, transvaginal scan of a uterus, the urinary bladder should be in the left upper corner of the uterus, uh, of, of the image. Uh, if the bladder is on the right upper corner, then you are reversed. So here the bladder is on the left upper corner. This is an antiverted position. Now when you rotate the probe counterclockwise, we usually start, of course, in the sagittal projection. You always keep your thumb on the notch. There's Every transducer is notched in some way either has a flat surface or a line or a notch or something that shows you that that's how the beam comes out sagittally, like this. So now you must rotate it counterclockwise. Don't rotate it the other way, clockwise, or you will reverse your right and left sides. Okay, so we've taken the sagittal beam counterclockwise. Now we can scan the pelvis and correctly put place the right and left side. We do have to check our technique. We want to check our depth. Always check your gain, which means your TGC and your overall gain, and make sure that the focus is set correctly. First of all, adjust your depth settings. You should start with the maximal depth setting. Uh, you want to see as deep into the pelvis as possible. You want to look around and then reset your depth so that you can see two to three centimeters beyond the margin of an organ. Uh, when you start out, you should have your depth open, quickly look around, and then reset it. Fill up the picture with your organ of interest, in this case the uterus, but don't fill it up too much. Don't let the back wall of the uterus come up to the very edge of your image of your picture because a mass that's exophytic or very close adjacent to the uterus could be cut off. In this case, uh, this was too much um, of a change in, in depth. This was a very shallow depth and something back here behind uh, the uterus could have been 
cut off. So this would not be good. We want to step back, make sure we can clear two to three centimeters beyond the organ. Here was um, a situation where the depth, uh, here we're focusing on the cervix. It, the cervix was now made to fill most of the picture. And what's happening here is we're missing the fact that there is a very large mass here behind the cervix. If we had our depth maximal, we would have seen that this, there was a mass uh, deep in the cul-de-sac. And, of course, if we had our transabdominal pre-scan, we would know that something's going on and there's a uterus and there's a mass, and we would have to evaluate everything. So this was going backwards, but if you were going in the proper sequence, transabdominal, then you go to maximal depth, then you change uh, to shallow depth uh, and high detail, you would have covered all bases. Another example. Uh, this looks like almost a uterus with some fluid inside of it. Uh, but uh, actually, this is just the cervix with a little bit of fluid. The entire corpus is, is missing here because our depth is too shallow. We want to open our depth, look around, then change our depth and focus on parts um, uh, of the um, structure. Another example, an ovary with uh, uh, a physiologic uh, cyst in it. If uh, we would have had maximal depth first, we could have used that cyst to um, scan deeper into the pelvis and see that there's an ectopic pregnancy back here. So we have to start with maximal depth, then focus uh, closer on, our, on an area of interest. We should scan so that um, we should image that so that there's a two to three centimeter margin beyond the um, border of any mass so that we don't miss uh, exophytic or adjacent masses. Here's a uterus that just about makes it into our field of view, but the whole um, anterior part here, caudal aspect, uh, are not well imaged. It just so happens that there actually is a mass sticking off the fundus of the uterus. And this was a pedunculated myoma that was pressing onto the bladder and then causing dysuria in this patient. Could have been missed. Now gain. Um, we have to adjust overall gain and, of course, our TGC curve. And we also uh, want to avoid false echoes within any kind of a fluid structure so that if we see free fluid, or fluid in, in an area, and it has some echoes, how do we know that those echoes are true uh, or actually false echoes? Here's, for example, a patient with a collapsed urinary bladder. We're scanning transvaginally. And there is some free fluid in the pelvis. There's some bowel loops. But we see some echoes. Are those real? Is this a hemoperitoneum, or is this pus in the pelvis? Uh, or is it just our gain setting? Well, we compare with a known anechoic area. The bladder has clean urine, and this has echoes. Therefore, these are real. And this was hemoperitoneum. Whenever we have uh, a fluid structure, uh, we should do uh, a gain analysis, uh, a low gain, high gain analysis. Uh, there was a pelvic mass here. Uh, it looked like it was completely anechoic, looked like um, clear, like the bladder. But when we slowly crank up the gain, we see that this mass fills in before the urinary bladder. So we know that these echoes are real, and we have to explain them. This was um, a um, chronic um, fluid structure that had developed some crystalline material. Okay, so we have our technique correct. We know our orientation. Now we start scanning, and the, before we, we go looking around in the, for uterus and ovaries, we should take a quick peek at the urinary bladder. So to do this, we have to angle the probe anteriorly, and that sometimes gives us that opportunity to find a very anterior mass, like in this patient. This was the um, uterus here, 
And we were trying to find the bladder, and we found that instead there was a very large mass there. Here's another patient. We tried to angle for the bladder, and there was an endometrioma plastered to the anterior surface of this um, uterus. So we can recognize anterior masses much better, not miss them. The other thing is we can find urinary uh, bladder masses or find some other condition. In this patient who was in severe pain, young woman in severe pain, it looked like uh, she had a dilated um, uh, bladder. Uh, with the transvaginal probe, as we scanned around, we tried to make sure that we saw the bladder and we found the little corner, it's in the left upper corner of our picture, and this mass, which happened to be the same mass, we realized that this was a mass, an ovarian mass, that had found its way anterior to the uterus and was not the bladder at all. The bladder was actually small and collapsed, and only because we looked for it were we able to, to see that there was truly a large mass in this patient, and it happened to be a torsion. Uh, we don't, so we don't want to mistake a cystic mass for the bladder. This was an adnexal torsion. There was the infarcted ovary. There was the dilated tube, and it was separate from the uh, collapsed bladder. Now, when we take a peek at that urinary bladder, which we often s just ignore during our scan, we may find something that's very significant. This was a 30-year-old uh, patient. She was having her first trimester ultrasound, and we just took a little peek and we saw an irregularity in the bladder. Took a little closer view, uh, this was her pregnant uterus, took a closer view and found a mass. Converted to a um, full bladder view and found an irregularly shaped mass. This was a transitional cell carcinoma in a first trimester patient. This was a 80-year-old lady. She's postmenopausal, and she came uh, for postmenopausal bleeding evaluation. But after we evaluated her uterus and her ovaries, we found that everything was fine. The endometrium was nice and thin. Uh, and we spotted in her bladder a couple irregular masses. Further investigation revealed that these were solid masses, and this woman had two transitional cell cancers in her bladder. It, was, it actually happened that this was not postmenopausal bleeding. This was actually hematuria. She complained that when she wiped herself with some tissue, she saw blood, and she right away thought it was vaginal spotting. But in fact, this was um, urine that had blood, hematuria. So now that we've quickly analyze the position of the bladder and the appearance of the bladder, we now move to the cervix. You should look at the cervix separately and directly. You want to be perpendicular to the uterus. Uh, you want to leave the rest of the endometrium and the fundus and the corpus out of your picture, 90 degrees to your area of interest. This helps you to quickly uh, see is there any kind of mass inside the uh, cervix. Uh, in cases of ectopics, the cervical ectopic could be there. Uh, deep cul-de-sac is imaged. That could be a place where a mass is hiding. Uh, this endocervical line is your guide into the endometrial cavity. This helps you with uterine positions. So we want a nice view of the cervix. This is not adequate. Such a, a view of the cervix, where the cervix is half cut off here, is not adequate. We want to be 90 degrees. Here we are a little better, but not, not good enough. We go completely 90 degrees, and we see that there is a mass in the cervix. It's actually bulging out. The mass was here, uh, and we were only imaging a part of it, because we were, we were not seeing the complete fundus, and we were not seeing the complete cervix. So we should start with the trans uh, uh, vaginal view of the cervix. And in this case, Doppler showed that there was a large vascular pedicle to this, and this alerted the surgeon that there could be hemorrhage uh, during removal of this mass. 
Here's another case where a pitfall did occur. A patient came in um, overnight bleeding uh, and a quick scan showed that it was an intrauterine pregnancy. And everybody was happy that there was an intrauterine pregnancy. However, the patient continued to bleed and bled profusely, which resulted in emergently going to the OR and, and sustaining a, a hysterectomy. What had happened in retrospect was there was a cervical ectopic. Well, the cervix was never looked at. The fact that we saw the uh, intrauterine pregnancy was uh, uh, made everybody feel that this was just an IUP and nobody really took the time to investigate the cervix which had another pregnancy in it, a much more dangerous pregnancy, which resulted in massive hemorrhage to this patient. This was in the days before IR, the days before we were using methotrexate, but this uh, poor patient lost her uterus because nobody spotted that there was an abnormal pregnancy in the cervix as well. It gives us a quick look at the deep cul-de-sac where we could see echogenic fluid, in this case hemoperitoneum. We could see even peritoneal implants in these patients who have histories of malignancies. The cervix is a guide to the uh, rest of the uh, endometrial cavity. Uh, here, we, when we follow the endocervical line, it leads us straight into the cavity, and we know this is an intrauterine pregnancy. We would never mistake this for being uh, anywhere else. Here, we, it guides us straight in. We get the orientation. We can measure the endometrium, which is a, a proper measurement. Here was a patient, a postmenopausal woman with bleeding. Uh, she has a small uterus, uh, and uh, we saw that there was some echogenic material in here. We wanted a good measurement of her endometrial thickness. So we use the cervix as a guide to lead us straight in. We have a longitudinal position of orientation. We know this is the longitudinal uterus, and now we can measure the endometrium correctly, which was way too thick, and this was endometrial carcinoma. The um, position of the, it, it helps us with position of the uterus. The uterus can have variable positions in the pelvis, uh, and this can become problematic when we're scanning. So we use this uh, cervix to guide us into the endometrial cavity, and then we can establish whether there is some degree of obliquity in the, with, to the uterus. Is, we can see, is it tilted? Is it rotated? So let's look a little closer at how our beam uh, works with this kind of uterus. This is the standard, standard sagittal scan through the um, uterus. Now, if we have um, a tilting, a, a, a tilting to one side or the other, we keep our beam um, in a longitudinal plane down the middle. We, we would have followed it through the cervix into the endometrial cavity, and we realize that the longest length of this, the longest axis is tilted from midline. It's, it can also be obliqued and rotated. Sometimes the uterus is oblique, so to get its longest axis, we have to actually rotate the beam. Now notice where I have this black dot. This black dot means that it's the top of the ultrasound beam. Okay, so as we come in sagittally, this is the top of the beam. And in order to find this uterus, which was actually rotated and obliqued, uh, we had to turn so that the top of the beam is here. And in order to then get, that's its longitudinal axis, but to get its coronal axis, we have to keep rotating the probe counterclockwise 90 degrees, which ends up way down there in order to get our coronal view of the uterus. It would be very hard to understand this if you didn't think of uh, how your beam is positioned, how the cervix helps you and leads you into the uh, center portion of the uterus. So uh, here's an example. This uterus was 
rotated and obliqued and tilted. And the person scanning had no idea what was going on and just took some kind of endometrial measurement. Well, what had happened was, had you followed the uh, protocol, get your longest axis of the uterus, then rotate 90 degrees, one could measure uh, the endometrium correctly. The endometrium should have been measured uh, on a 90 degree plane from this. The uterus can be antiverted, usually. It could be in the mid portion of the pelvis, or it could be retroverted. Uh, and we have to understand the position so we can place masses correctly, place fibroids correctly in such a plane. So here's the standard view. This is sagittal. This is anterior. So this is the anterior wall rotated 90 degrees. Let's look at that again. This is the anterior wall of the body, but this is the anterior wall of the patient, patient's uterus. This is the posterior wall of the uterus. We know that the fundus is pointing towards the anterior of the patient's body, but the anterior anatomic wall is here. Notice that the anterior wall closest to the beam, closest to the beam, is on the upside of the picture. Right? The beam hits the anterior wall first. Anterior wall is closest to the origin of the beam. The uterus has somewhat of a donut shape, has an endometrium located centrally. Now look at this uterus. It's a mid-position uterus. Here, it points down. It's parallel to our beam. And when we turn 90 degrees, we actually get a true coronal frontal cut of the uterus. So this is a mid-position uterus. Nowhere near does it look like the antiverted uterus. Turn 90 degrees, send a coronal beam through the uterus, and you get a coronal shot. But both of these uteruses are parallel to the beam, which means we're not going to get as good resolution. So here's, here's, an, here's the example. This is the sagittal longitudinal beam. Notice a lot of dropout. Notice that there's an IUD, but we can hardly see its position. It's because this kind of uterus is parallel to the beam. When we turn 90 degrees, we don't do much better. We still don't see very well because it's still parallel, and we hardly see that IUD. That's the mid-pelvis uterus. Now, the retroverted uterus, okay, this is the flipped back uterus. Watch where the walls are. The anterior wall of the uterus is here. The anterior wall ends up being deep in the pelvis so that the beam hits posterior wall, anterior wall. Anterior wall is in the deep part of the pelvis, opposite from the antiverted uterus. So this is anterior wall. This is posterior wall. Let's do that again. Beam strikes posterior wall, anterior wall. Beam strikes posterior wall, anterior wall. This is the anatomic anterior wall of the uterus. So when you see um, a cross-section of a uterus like this and it has a fibroid on it, you should not jump to conclusions that this is a posterior fibroid. Because the answer here to this question, which wall is the fibroid on, the answer is, well, it depends on the position of the uterus. If this is a retroverted uterus, then this deep fibroid is on the anterior wall. If this is an antiverted uterus, then it will be on the posterior wall. So we have to know the position of the uterus. So here it is with the fibroid. Retroverted uterus has a fibroid on the anterior wall, so that ends up to be deep in the pelvis. The anterior wall is deep, so the fibroid 
registers deep in the pelvis. Okay, let's do that again here. The beam hits posterior wall, anterior wall, anterior wall is the deep part of the pelvis. Now, obstetricians and gynecologists don't always um, get hung up on antiverted position, retroverted position, uh, because uteruses can actually be flipped back and forth. Let me show you an example here. This is a patient with a, a small calcification in the anterior wall. A few seconds later, the uterus flips into a retroverted position here, and, and, and now we can prove to ourselves, yes, that is the anterior wall uh, of the uterus. And you can sometimes do this with the probe by changing position. Here the probe is in the anterior fornix. Here the probe is in the posterior fornix. And you can sometimes have this uh, uterus flip positions within a matter of minutes. The important thing is to understand where that anterior posterior wall is so that you can place masses correctly or fibroids uh, and not confuse uh, the surgeon. You should know the blind spots in the pelvis. The blind spots are far above the fundus of the uterus, far lateral on the pelvic sidewalls, deep in the cul-de-sac, or very far anterior. You should be persistent about finding ovaries. Um, here's a uh, fibroid uterus. You look quickly transabdominally. You see that the uterus is big. You don't see any other masses. You look transvaginally and you realize that you can't see most of the uterus, but you use this opportunity to look for ovaries. You find an ovary beautifully, but you can't find the other one. So you have to go back transabdominally. Go back transabdominally and look high along the iliac uh, borders to see the ovary. This is a complete evaluation. You don't just stop and say, I can't see anything, I can't see ovaries. You make an, an effort to find them. Maneuver the probe. Push with the probe. Check mobility of the mass. Separate masses. Elicit pain. Change position of the uterus to improve imaging. Use your non-scanning hand to palpate a mass or pull down on the ovary, pull it down towards the pelvis, uh, create a wave, see if things move, twist and turn the probe to try to unravel um, the tubular masses. Here's a, a, looks like an ovary, but the patient had um, a question of an ectopic and we saw something that possibly could be an ectopic, but could this be a corpus luteum in the ovary? We would push with the probe and we try to separate them. And it turned out that the ovary rolled that way and the ectopic moved this way so that they were actually separate structures and not connected. Here's a, a mass uh, we want to prove is that it is stuck to the uterus or not. So we push on it and when the mass moves, the uterus moves. At no time were they moving in separate directions. We can change position of the um, uterus by pushing around. Here, this uterus looks like it's kind of parallel with the beam, and we know that's not optimal for sonography. So we go, we push the probe into the posterior fornix and push that uterus a little bit. And now it flips back uh, posteriorly into a retroverted type position, which makes it more perpendicular to the beam, which is good for sonography, good for B scanning, and we get much better detail about the uterus. Another example, uterus looks kind of clumpy, kind of parallel to the beam, can't resolve even endometrium. We push the probe into the anterior fornix, and that brings us closer, puts the uterus more in a perpendicular orientation, and we can actually measure the endometrium and see things much better. Maneuver your probe, twist and turn. Don't mistake a tubal mass for a septated ovarian mass. Try to unravel septated masses. Make sure they're not tubes that are folded over on themselves. In this case, it looked like there was a cystic adnexal mass, but when we turned the probe around, we saw that the, this was opening up into a dilated fluid-filled uh, tubular uh, structure, hydrosalpings. Uh, again, 
a, a mass that looks like, like a septated ovarian mass. But when we move the probe around, twist and turn, we unravel this mass and we realize that it's a hydrosalpings and not an ovarian mass at all. Another thing to, to avoid pitfalls is use Doppler. Use it uh, liberally. Uh, it'll help you avoid pseudo ovaries, uh, helps you uh, find true tubular structures versus vessels, uh, helps you work out unusual cystic masses or unusual uterine masses, confirm, confirm color Doppler, uh, well, you have to confirm color Doppler with spectral tracing. That's, that's one way to avoid pitfalls. Uh, and with torsion and ring of fires, I want to make a couple comments. Here's an, something that looks kind of like an ovary. You turn on your Doppler. It isn't. It's just a cross-section of the para-uterine vessels. We make up ovaries all the time, so we have to be careful uh, with this. What's happening here is we're slicing through some of these vessels that are coming in uh, to the uterus. So we don't want to make that mistake. Here's another way of avoiding pseudo-ovaries. It looks like an ovary filled with follicles. But when you turn on it and work it out, you realize these are just nabothian cysts uh, in the uh, uterine cervix. Use Doppler for tubular structures. This looks like a hydrosalpinx. Turn on color. Oops, it's just a vessel, a vein. This one looks like a hydrosalpinx. Nope, it is filled with blood flow, and that's just a prominent vessel. How about this one, where there's a postmenopausal lady that has uh, a, quote, cystic mass, but there's something not quite right about this cystic mass. Where's the through transmission? Well, uh, it's certainly as anechoic as the bladder, but we don't have good through transmission. When, when something doesn't look right, turn on the Doppler. And this happens to be an iliac artery aneurysm. Not exactly uh, a job for a gynecologic surgeon to handle. Uh, unusual areas in the uterus uh, that are um, puzzling to us, turn on the Doppler. In this case, there was myometrial inhomogeneity and had some little irregular cystic areas. We turn on the Doppler, and it's high flow with low resistance. Turns out to be an arteriovenous fistula. Could be an arteriovenous malformation. It was composed of tortuous, tubular, cystic structures that had an unusual pattern. Again, this is not something that uh, would be surgical. Now, when we do Doppler, please keep in mind that any findings with color Doppler have to be confirmed with a spectral tracing uh, because color Doppler ultrasound signals may show artifactual flow. Uh, here's a mass, looks like it has some blood flow in it. But when we do a spectral tracing, we cannot really get a good arterial or venous signal because these are flash artifacts. Uh, at the periphery of the mass, yes, we do have arterial blood flow but there was really no true flow inside the mass. Here's another case where there was a pelvic mass uh, that had, uh, it seemed, some blood flow. This is a power Doppler. Well, we do a spectral tracing, and we see for sure there is arterial flow, and this now is a solid mass, uh, adnexal mass, which turned out to be a tumor deposit. Um, in the pelvis. Now, ovarian torsion is uh, an area which is fraught with uh, pitfalls. Uh, that would require a whole separate um, topic uh, for a lecture, but I just want to highlight a point that when we do Doppler with ovarian torsion, we should not rely solely on the Doppler for the diagnosis of torsion. Why? because absent ovarian blood flow does not mean ovarian torsion. We may see absent flow even in a normal ovary. This could be because of technical reasons. This could be because of physiologic reasons that the ovary is resting in that part of the menstrual cycle. And now the opposite of that is presence of blood flow 
in an ovary does not exclude torsion. You can have an ovary that's undergoing torsion, uh, and often we do see arterial or venous blood flow. And that's actually good because that means that that ovary is probably salvageable. It, it does improve our ovarian salvage rate because there is still a blood flow um, supplying that ovary. So we should trust the 2D picture more than we trust the Doppler as far as ovarian torsion. We can look for uh, 2D signs, mainly an enlarged, swollen, edematous ovary. Many times the follicles are pushed towards the periphery of the ovary. Sometimes there is an ovarian mass that causes the twist. So the 2D impression is very important. Uh, blood flow, seeing arterial or venous blood flow within a swollen ovary with peripheral follicles is a good thing. We should not discount the fact that this could be torsion uh, because this is a salvageable or, or it, it, it hopefully will be a salvageable kind of ovary, which it was in this case. They were able to untwist the ovary and this 23-year-old woman did not lose uh, her ovary. I want to make a couple comments on Ring of Fire because that's another big pitfall. Um, Ring of Fire was first described with ectopic pregnancy and has sort of stuck in our minds as a sign of ectopic pregnancy. Well, yes, it could be a sign of ectopic pregnancy, but much more commonly it is a sign of a corpus luteum. Uh, the corpus luteum cyst is much more likely to have a ring of fire and it is much, much more common than the ectopic pregnancy. Here they look identical. Either one could be an ectopic or either one could be a corpus luteum. And that ring of fire statistically is more likely to be related to a corpus luteum than to an ectopic pregnancy. So once again, we should not rely on the ring of fire. We use the 2D, not the Doppler, to differentiate the ectopic from a corpus luteum. Uh, the ectopic is separate from the ovary. The corpus luteum is part of the ovary. So that's an important point. And last but not least, uh, when you've gone through all these steps carefully, trying to avoid these pitfalls, and if you're not coming up with an explanation for the patient's uh, gynecologic complaints, think of some things outside of GYN conditions. Think of um, a urinary tract problems like renal calculi, uh, in which case you'd go looking for uh, a uh, renal calculus. This is a convert here to a transvaginal. There is an echogenic focus here, uh, which could be a little, we're, we're suspecting a ureterovesical junction uh, stone. Here we put on our color, the twinkle confirms that that's a stone, and the jet shows us that there is urine flowing past the stone, but it's spraying out into the um, bladder. It doesn't have that nice little jet because uh, this is serving as a partial uh, obstruction. Uh, so we would have do the full evaluation. Here's another example. A stone in the distal ureter, beautifully documented by transvaginal sonography, turned crosswise. There's the echogenic focus with the acoustic shadow. And think of not just GU system, think of GI conditions, appendicitis, inflammatory bowel diseases, abscesses, colon cancer, fistulae. You can pick those up transvaginally. Uh, here's appendicitis. This is a pelvic appendix that caused gynecologic symptoms. And it has, uh, we look for that gut signature. We look for a blind ending tubular structure with layers and, and, and appendicolith, if we're lucky. Uh, here crosswise, we can see multiple rings, hyperchoic, hypo, hyper, hypo, hyper. These are, this is gut signature. Uh, turn longitudinally, blind ending tubular structure, tender, painful, next to the ovary, irritates the ovary, presents as pelvic pain, not as right lower quadrant pain. Another case here where 
we suspect something else going on because we can't make a, a, a gynecologic diagnosis. And in this case, a mass, we look more carefully. We realize there's a calcification. That's the appendicolith. And there's a rupture. And there's now an abscess, ruptured appendix with an early abscess uh, in the pelvis. So we think outside of uh, gynecologic conditions. So in review then, how do we avoid pitfalls in transvaginal sonography? We go systematically. We get a good history. We scan, pre-scan transabdominally. We make sure we understand how the beam's coming out of the transducer and how our image is projected onto the screen. We check our technique. Uh, we uh, check for depth, gain, uh, focus. Uh, we, we, we will then look at the bladder, the cervix, then check the uterus. Look around in the adnexa, know our blind spots, make sure we find the ovaries, maneuver the probe, use our Doppler, and in the end, make sure if we don't have an answer, think beyond gynecologic conditions. Thank you for your attention.